welcome to another episode of Fridays with Fawn. I'm Fawn Lopez, publisher of Modern Healthcare and Vice President at Craig Communications. Thank you for joining us. Joining me today is Dr. Charlotte Lee, Chief of Staff for Big Health, an app-based digital therapeutic solution provider for insomnia and anxiety. Charlotte, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you as my guest. Thanks so much, Fawn. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So um, you have a super interesting career, I must say. Is it correct that you started your career as a ballerina who trained with the Royal Ballet in London? And what did you do? What did you learn from that experience? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, you're correct. Um, I think, you know, one of the first images that come to me is uh, well, first of all, I'm 32 years old. And I said to my mom in a, in a bus stop, you know, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. And I think back then I was between three or four. Um, it was genuinely the first time I'd expressed such a strong desire. Um, and I was really lucky enough to have parents who did everything that they could to support my dreams. Chief among my many lessons was discipline. Um, my ballet teacher told me many times to show up no matter what you know, give 110%, um, it's about performance and, you know, giving your all to your audience. Um, and I also learned to accept pain and failure, much pain and much failure, as, as part of the process of achieving a great, a great performance. And then looking back, I realized just how vastly valuable that experience was. I learned how to be a great team player. I saw what good leadership looked like. I saw how years of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears were just made so worthwhile with just one night of a standing ovation. Um, yeah, and I still use many of those early lessons today. That's amazing. And so from there, you transitioned to medical school and became a doctor. What led you to pursue a career in Wow. Um, you know, like many people have multiple passions. Um, I imagine you do too. I felt whilst physically challenged and I loved the performance aspect um, of being a dancer. I felt cognitively quite stuck. And, you know, around my teens, I'd started to fall in love with the sciences. Um, I started to become quite good at the whole sort of academic science side of things. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, I didn't even know I wanted to be a doctor until quite late on, to be honest. I just knew that I loved problem solving. Um, I loved human biochemistry, uh, that I was drawn to the art of engaging people. But, and I wanted it all, right? I wanted it all. Um, and I can also attest to the fact that Grey's Anatomy played a not insignificant role in my decision making. Uh, Chris, Christina. Um, so I you know, did some work experience at a hospital and I realized that I loved the world. I was fascinated with interviewing the patients, really learning about why they were there. You know, the holistic picture of, you know, their story, um, seeing all of these interventions happening, like the choreography, you know, to bring it back to the dance metaphor of the technicians, the nurses, the porters, the doctors, the therapists, all working in concert together to treat an individual and I just thought I that's a team that I want to be part of. That's awesome. So I also understand that you co-founded um, your first tech startup as a junior doctor. That um, startup did not take off but your interest in digital health grew. So can you talk to me about that transition and how you ended up at Big Health? Yeah, well, it's a story. Um, I hope you have some time. When you look back to, what was it, so 2007, uh, when I started med school, digital health was a rudimentary fringe subject and it maintained um, its very fringe nature right through until I was a junior doctor. Um, and back then, you know, 10 years ago, if you asked someone about digital health, they'd have asked, you know, which finger or toe uh, are you talking about rather than digital as in technology? So it certainly wasn't established. Um, and I just didn't see that much innovation happen 
in my day to day as a clinician. And, you know, I, amongst many others at the time, realized that there was this huge opportunity for technology to shift this sector and the way that we delivered healthcare. And I just wanted to get ahead of this wave. I was so, so excited to see what was going to happen because I thought it's inevitable that digital health will become, you know, a primary feature of how we delivered healthcare. Uh, <laughs> naively uh, and very arrogantly, I thought that I could do it myself. So you mentioned that I co-founded my first tech startup. Uh, yes, I, I started off trying to build a clinical temp, like staff recruitment platform, peer to peer. Uh, it was meant to be super transparent, drive down costs for hospitals, improve the experience uh, for the technicians, the temp staff, the clinicians that were going around hospital by the hospital and not knowing their different systems. However, you know, after about six months, my co-founder left for Australia uh, because there were you know, better job opportunities over there. And so, you know, I then realized, OK, well, I don't one, I have no idea how to build a business. I know how to put people together, but I don't necessarily know how to lead. So I applied for a leadership fellowship position. I got it. Think of it as 50% medicine, 50% leadership training based at the very world famous Moorfields Eye Hospital. I loved it, improved some patient waiting times for eye clinics. I collaborated with an absolutely brilliant, she was absolutely brilliant eye surgeon and unsuccessfully pitched my second startup to Google DeepMind Health for our digital eye clinic concept, so second failure. Um, so I started to realize that, you know, to, to change medicine for the better, I shouldn't really be building companies. I seem to not be very good at it, um, but I should learn how it all gets organized, you know, how do health systems um, develop, how are they managed, how are they funded? So, um, I became a management consultant specializing in healthcare redesign. I became a little bit smarter, a little bit more humble, uh, learned a huge amount around how health systems were designed, and then used this experience to jump to an accelerator program, you know, a tech accelerator program in London, to franchise, franchise out their digital health program across the UK. So I ended up being very lucky in that I supported about 100 small to medium sized enterprises, developed a great network in the NHS, you know, a good understanding of digital health and where it was going. Um, and then I met Big Health. So, you know, what genuinely struck me, oh, sorry, I'll let you go on. Go ahead, please. I think that if there's one thing that I would leave you with was that what genuinely struck me about Big Health was that there was so much evidence behind the claims um, and that you can't, you can't really say that of a lot of the digital health companies that are in existence today. So glad to see more women in technology, health technology. So, um, so you pick a, a great a path for your career. So congratulations. Big Health uh, has partnered with the Scottish government to make digital therapeutics available through their NHS. Um, what can the U.S. healthcare system learn from this partnership, uh, given that we're so different? Yeah, there's a lot to say here. You know, I think, first of all, we are very lucky. Um, the Scottish government is an absolutely brilliant partner. They genuinely stood out as one of the most innovative countries in the world when it came to mental health. Um, they'd adopted a truly sort of digital first approach to mental health. And they'd established this for six years before we even came along. Um, and it was all about providing evidence-based mental health treatments in a scalable way, uh, using digital technology for anyone in need. And so, you know, with this partnership, over 5 million people have access to daylight for anxiety and sleep for insomnia making Scotland the first country in the world to make digital therapeutics available nationally, which is amazing. However, when you think about the Scottish government and the NHS in Scotland, it's structured in a very, very different way to the US. And so the way that we're able to implement and the way that we're able to get funded is, you know, almost head and tails, like different to the way that you would expect things to happen within the US. Um, 
there was a, a lot of lessons learned. And I think one of the big lessons was that with a coordinated health system, you can get funded centrally. And that was a really big hypothesis to be tested, you know, even, even sort of three years ago. Um, as long as you meet really stringent quality criteria, um, and you can benefit millions in need. All of this is possible. However, I think that the fragmentation of the US healthcare system, whilst you're going to have huge numbers impacted with just, for example, one partnership with a PBM or a health plan, it's unlikely that you're going to see this type of sort of radical national coverage happening. But I, you know, I still have hope. Um, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why, you know, and that's why I'm really excited about some of the work that Big Health is doing as well. You know, we're still at this very early stage with digital therapeutics. So who knows? You know, the uh, history is yet to be written, I think, in terms of digital therapeutics for the US. Thank you. So the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly increased um, the pre uh, prevalence of depression, anxiety and other mental health conditions in children and adults around the globe, especially those in underserved uh, populations. From your perspective, what are your, um, what are our, some of our biggest challenges today and what do we need to do to solve them? Yeah, well, you know, the mental health crisis is ultimately an access issue. Um, you've got an increasing number of mental health solutions. That's great. However, the majority of adult Americans are still unable to receive guideline recommended care. Most are prescribed drugs, you know, and this is really the only option for many people, or they get nothing. This is, it's, it's because the standard of care, therapy and drugs as an adjunct are insufficient really to meet demand. So let's say you've got 100 million adult Americans with a mental health condition, fewer than 22% uh, will access non-drug care through a therapist, and 35% of the population will receive medications, mostly prescribed in primary care, you know, your GPs and community. Um, but, you know, when you look at some of these drugs, as a clinician, I'm concerned, you know, you've got hypnotics, you've got benzos, benzodiazepines. These are really addictive medications. You know, the FDA has black box warnings because of these uh, the high risk of side effects. So you've got this issue where there's increasing mental health demand and there's essentially like stagnating mediocre set of options uh, for the people that we need to that we need to treat. So if we want to tackle this crisis, we need to create a completely different treatment modality to fill the gap. Um, which is why I'm so excited about digital therapeutics. It allows us for the first time to offer non-drug clinical treatments for mental health. Like that's that's amazing in a very yeah. scalable way through CBT. Um, and the fact that, you know, they are rigorously tested. We've talked about randomized control trials and now we've got 13. Um, that brings credibility and also trust with the general public as well as clinicians that this, these, these things are safe and effective to use. That is awesome. So congratulations to you and Big Health. Am I right to say that um, the pandemic, uh, the pandemic has, there's some, a lot of things, good things that came out of, of the pandemic. And one of them is the, uh, is that there's less stigma associated with mental health conditions. What does that, uh, this progress mean for the future of mental health care in the US or around the world? Yeah, I think this is, it's great progress. Look, this is so impactful. There are many times in my life where I felt unable to talk about my mental health or even have the vocabulary to describe, uh, you know, my deteriorating mental health at the time because of this stigma. So it's great because it means more people are aware of the problems, how to describe it. and Hopefully, that means more people are seeking help also. However, it doesn't mean that stigma disappears. You know, it, the fact that it's becoming destigmatized actually only increases the demand on mental health services. 
And so unless we have ways of meeting that demand, we're going to exacerbate this access gap, um, which are welcome. Um, so, you know, you and I both know we, not every therapist is for everyone. Um, I think I read somewhere that 53% of racial or ethnic minorities report experiencing microaggressions in the course of their therapy. Um, however, when implemented effectively, software doesn't judge or discriminate. And actually it can be personalized to you with a thousand different iterations of how therapy is delivered based on how you want to have that therapy delivered. So you know, that's also why I think digital therapeutics is really exciting. It can completely destigmatize the language and make it personalized in every way, shape and form to you, who you are and how you want to receive therapy. So I really appreciate the conversation about mental health. So thank you um, for, for sharing your perspectives and, and thoughts on and solutions of, uh, on how to address, how we can better address mental health care. Um, so I've got a question for you. You're very busy. Uh, it seems like you're very you're very dedicated to your work. What keeps you up at night? And more importantly, uh, what gets you up in the morning? Uh, well, that's quite uh, that's quite topical because I've just come back from New, New Zealand, so it's five a.m. for me. Uh, so what actually gets me up in the morning is jet lag right now. Um, uh, I'm hoping to get over that with a little spot of sleep here later, but. Lately, my gosh, like the state of the world, Fawn, you know, the safety of my family and friends, it feels like it's been a barrage, you know. Um, I wouldn't say that I stress about it all the time, but it's definitely something that is constantly in the background, you know, Ukraine, climate change, a more isolated society, inflation, COVID, the fact that we weren't able to travel and visit family. It was, you know, my trip to New Zealand was the first time I'd seen extended family in over two years. Um, and I think I'm exhausted. I think we all, we're all exhausted from having to deal with, deal with all of this. Um, so I think it's just that, you know, in the back of my mind constantly, you know, and as someone who loves control and managing risk, it's it's only you know contributing to uh you know this sense of being like overwhelmed um but you know the fact that we have solutions for that is awesome um what gets me up in the morning well as you said i'm very dedicated to my work i i left medicine because i wanted to have a more scalable way of impacting patients globally um and i felt that i wasn't able to do that singularly you know with uh with clinical practice and whilst i can't change the world and deal with all of these things around climate change etc i'm i'm satisfied that what i'm doing right now is going to get me to my you know to my primary goal you know that it'll help at least you know a couple thousand more people one step closer to evidence-based care and maybe another thousand closer to recovery like that that is really meaningful for me well, thank you for that. Um, as you said just a few minutes ago, that I don't think anyone has not been affected by all that's been going on around us in the last two and a half years or almost three years now. So um, we can all relate to, uh, to to some of the comments that you made about what keeps you up at night. So so thank you for, for your transparency and for sharing uh, that with us. Um, so leadership, you talked about how, you know, being a ballerina helped you um, gain some leadership skills. If you were to go back in time, 10 years, what would you tell yourself about leadership that you didn't know then? Well, I'd go back to that 22 year old and uh, give her a bit of a shake and tell her not to not be so daft. Um, I've I've learned a whole lot. I think leadership is for me an act, not really a goal. You can't learn it through books. Um, you have to really get out there and do it. Um, find great mentors like Fawn. Learn from them. 
make mistakes, but most importantly, learn from those mistakes. And expect to make a lot along the way. So get comfortable with failure. Um, so it's that, but also, you know, the, the purpose of a leader is really to serve those around them. Um, I've been really proud of building a team and to you know, give as many opportunities as possible to those around me uh, to have a leg up. And to be able to do that, I feel like over the years, ironically, uh, it's meant, first of all, working on yourself and appreciating many of your own blind spots and some of those unhelpful beliefs. Because you can start conferring them onto those on your team. And I've seen so many times that like, a team's dysfunctions is a reflection of the leader's dysfunctions. So, you know, I tell that 22 year old, you know, be kind to yourself. And in turn, you'll be kind to others. You'll stop holding people to it's stupidly high and realistic expectations. And you genuinely see yourself as well as them perform as a cohesive unit. Um, That's great. Very, very, very uh, solid and uh, sage advice to your younger self and to all of us, actually. Cheryl, it's been such a pleasure talking with you. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, especially just coming back from such a an exhaustive trip, fun but exhaustive in terms of travel. So thank you for, for sharing uh, your time and your story with us. Absolute pleasure, as always. Um, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for you joining us today. And as always, I look forward to seeing you at um, next month. Uh, at the next episode of Fridays with Vaughn. Please don't forget to mark your calendar for the 2022 Women Leaders in Healthcare Conference, which we will, will be held on July 14th and 15th in Chicago. I promise it will be a fantastic event. You wouldn't want to miss it. So until next time, thank you for joining me. Mm -hmm.